Our second scripture reading is from the 12th chapter of Genesis, verses 1 to 4. Listen again for the word of the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, Leave your land, your family, and your father's household, for the land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and will bless you. I will make your name respected, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and those who curse you I will curse. All the families of the earth will be blessed because of you. Abram left just as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. This too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Philadelphia is a city that attracts many tourists. From Independence Hall, to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, to the Schuylkill and the Delaware Rivers, to the Liberty Bell, Edgar Allan Poe's home, to Betsy Ross's house, and Ben Franklin's grave. Cheese steaks, with or without cheese, <laughs> soft pretzels, scrapple, water, the culture, the cuisine, the history of that one little city is pretty remarkable. And Philadelphia even started out as our nation's capital after a brief stint in New York City. So the city was a major area of commerce in the first days of the nation. Immigrants were looking for homes, schools were being established, the government was trying to figure things out, houses were being built, and churches were crucial to daily living. I imagine Philadelphia in its early days was much like the biblical city of Haran. Now, Haran is in northern Mesopotamia and was similar at that time to what Philadelphia was in the 1700s. It's also the town Abram was in when God spoke to him and told him to leave. Now, I imagine Abram had a decent life in Haran. After all, his father named his brother after the city. And the passage just before what I read in Genesis is a genealogy. So after they left Ur, Abram and the family settled in Haran. They were headed for Canaan, but instead settled in Haran on the way there. Now this was not uncommon in biblical times. People often roamed about, sometimes of their own choosing, and sometimes because war or a change in leadership drove them out. But Haran was a bustling place full of <coughs> commerce and trade. And churches that were there served as the center for worship of a moon god named Sin. And Abram and his family were pretty wealthy people. And the majority of their wealth was gotten during their time in Haran. So essentially, while they were living there, they had everything they needed and more. They named family members after the city, as I said. And Haran is the city that later generations of Jacob and Esau are instructed to return to. So it, it was a pretty happening place. So it was no small request of God to ask Abram and company to leave. Now the city name itself means highway or crossroad. So it's not an unusual occurrence that that's exactly where Abram found himself, at a crossroad. So what happens when you are at a crossroad? Just this past week in Louisiana, uh, 
a pastor friend of mine, when she was picked up from the airport in New Orleans after her own snow delay in North Jersey, found out quickly that her driver's GPS died on the way from the airport to the retreat center. So what happens if you are on a highway, you have no idea <clears throat> where you're coming from, and no idea in which you're supposed to be traveling? Would it make the decision to go any easier if you knew there would be blessing, such as land, children, wealth? If blessing was on the next step of your journey and waiting for you when you got there. <clears throat> now we know how Abram's story continues because we can read about it in Genesis. We know that eventually God changes the name of Abram to Abraham and changes his wife's name, Sarai, to Sarah. <coughs> We know that Sarah is barren, and so she gives her servant girl, Hagar, to Abram, and Ishmael is born out of that encounter, and then later Sarah gives birth to Isaac, and then the, the story goes on from there. But at this point in the journey, Abram didn't know any of that was going to happen. He was setting out with his father, with his barren wife, and he was just following wherever God was guiding. Maybe that was easier for Abram than it is for most of us. But then again, maybe not. Though we have only known each other for a few years, many of you have shared your crossroad with me. Whether it's been a medical procedure or surgery, the birth of a new baby, the death of a loved one, a new job or relationship, a new marriage, or the dissolution of a marriage. Every one of those life events, life decisions, brings you to a crossroad. Even if you're not the one who's personally navigating that crossroad. And sometimes you can see the options of which way to go, but making that decision to go is so tough. And two weeks ago at a Valley clergy meeting, the image of crossing the threshold of a doorway came up. So imagine that your crossroad is a doorway. Sometimes we know which way we need to go once we walk through that door. And we know that God is standing behind us going, go. But it's still hard to walk through that doorway. It's the same idea as a crossroad. And whether you like the image of a doorway or a crossroad or an intersection, the thing is, in any of those images, we can't stay planted in it. We can't stand in the middle of an intersection or a busy doorway for a long time before we've got to get out of the way and go. Even if there are things that try and keep us from moving, like doubt or fear or uncertainty, or anxiety. But God is saying to us, leave your land, your family, and your household for the land that I will show you. And the one thing that God doesn't say is how hard it actually is to do that. A lot of the stories of God calling people Seems like God calls and people respond immediately with, okay. But we know life isn't that easy. We have family and friends to worry about. 
money and things to arrange, plans to make, arrangements for when we get there, etc. And being a person of faith doesn't mean that you're just required to go, okay, when God calls. Ask any clergy person and they will tell you that their call into ministry did not consist of God saying, go, and them saying, okay. Life is always more complicated than that. And scripture seems to always leave that part out, particularly in the story of Abram. Scripture doesn't mention that maybe, maybe Abram had sleepless nights of worry leading up to his decision to go. It doesn't mention the conversations he may have had with his family about what God was asking him to do. And it doesn't mention all the loose ends that had to be tied up or the plans that had to be made in order for them to go where God was leading. Things are rarely as simple as, go, okay. So spend time during the remainder of this Lenten season listening for God to say to you, go, listen for where God is calling you. And it is okay if you don't immediately respond with, Okay, it's okay to take time to think and to plan and to arrange and even to question and to doubt. Because if God wanted blind obedience from us, God would never have given us free will. Philadelphia is still a commercial hub with culture and cuisine and equal busyness, if not more, than it had in the 1700s. So the city was a crossroad then, and it was again in 2014 when it served as a crossroad for me, when I decided I needed to distance myself from the hustle and the bustle and the mindset of an urban area. Having grown up in that way of life, leaving a city environment was not an easy choice for me. I had family and comfort nearby. And let me tell you, I certainly didn't answer, okay, the second God said, go. So spend time this Lent thinking about where God is encouraging you to go in your life. Consider it in prayer. <clears throat> Talk it over with family. Make all of your arrangements and your plans. And then go. You are the only one who can say, okay, when you're standing at a crossroad, when you're standing at your Haran, and God says, go. Amen. <laughs>